Holy One who we name as love. Move through us by the power of your Spirit so that your word might teach us how to love in our turn. Amen. A couple came to see their pastor, not me, I assure you. The husband was terribly concerned about his wife's depression, and he had tried everything that he knew to help her to no avail, so brought her along to the minister, and the minister tried everything he knew, and no response. No response. She was not responding at all. And after about half an hour, the minister got up from his chair, pulled the woman out of her chair, wrapped his arms around her, and kissed her. And he turned to the husband and said, that's all your wife needs about three times a week, at least. And the man said, I can only bring her in on Thursday. (laughs) Sometimes we make the simplest things so complex. Most of us have seen the movie Casablanca, where the Humphrey Bogart figure, Rick, is a cold and cynical, hard-bitten man. His philosophy of life is summed up in the phrase, I don't stick my neck out for nobody. You see, Rick has no intention of risking anything in any sort of relationship because once, years ago, he did risk and was hurt. And so he figures the safest way to deal with his pain and protect himself is to wall himself off. But on the other hand, he looks at the Nazi officers who are frequenting his club and he sees them as cold and harsh and unwavering and there's something inside him that doesn't want to be that way either. So he's torn. Who would you like to be like? If you think of the people in your circle, who would you most like to be like? The the people who attract us most are generally not those who are walled off. They are not marooned on a lowly spit of life cut off from the rest of the world. They have shown that they can give love, therefore they're able to receive love. Those are the people who often attract us. Now, if you've been here all summer, you may be forgiven for a sense of deja vu. You may feel like I've been caught in this endless loop of talking about love because that's all we've been doing all summer. We keep coming back to it because that's what John's letter does. John's letter is like a spiral with a golden theme of love running through it. And every subject on which John touches returns to the matter of love. Love, if you like, becomes the reality test of our claims of faith. If we truly know God, then we love. Love in terms not of an emotion or a feeling, but a concrete commitment of word and deed, of thought and prayer to the good of the other. If we know God, then we love. If we don't love, we don't know God. That's John's equation. It's as simple and as straightforward as that. Our actions of love speak far louder than any of our protestations of faith. So if you like, this is where the rubber of faith meets the road of life. This is where all the stuff we talk about and all the stuff we sing about and all the stuff we claim to believe actually takes concrete form in the world. Of course, there is much more that we could say about God. A conversation about God could go on forever, but this is where it begins and ends for Christians. God is love. And God is that power in the universe, constantly seeking, constantly searching, constantly healing, constantly desiring the very best for us. 
And that love is made best known to us in Jesus the Christ. Jesus who endured everything and did everything as a sign of God's love. Love that comes from God to us and from us to the world. And we say that God is love because in sending Jesus into the world, we see God's character most clearly. It starts with God. It's also worth knowing, as many of you already know, that God's love makes our love possible. It's really important to to get this straight. John does not say we ought to love because God loved us, but John says we can love because God loves us. That's very different. We can love. It's not a, it's not a, you gotta do this thing. It, you can do this. For instance, you could, we can, get from Halifax to Vancouver in one day because of the efforts of early aviation pioneers like Wilbur and Orville Wright and hundreds of others. Their efforts make it possible. That doesn't mean you have to leave this service and rush out to the airport and get on a plane, but it's because of what they did that it is possible. It is because of God's love for us that it is possible for us to love in our turn. God's love makes possible what was not possible before. But we sometimes forget that, don't we? I hear people talking about the things they do as if they were initiating love, as if this was a brand new thing that they were bringing into the world. Or we talk about how hard it is to care for others and Oh my, what noble and wonderful souls we are, as if we in our turn had never received love. Well, put it bluntly, until we are as loving to others as God is to us in Jesus Christ, we are still owing and the scales are still unbalanced. Let's look at one practical aspect of this whole matter of love. Many people hang on to their anger and their grudges. They say, I can't help it. They make me so mad. Or, I just can't forgive what they did. How many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings movies? Well, only some of you then are going to understand this next illustration. The rest of you are are playing out of luck. Do you remember the figure of Golem taking out the ring and like, my precious, my precious? Well, sometimes people with their anger and their grudges remind me of Golem. We look, we're like that. We take out our anger and we take out our grudges and we polish them and we care for them and we feel again the rage and the hurt. And we say we can't let go, which of course is a lie because we let go of things every day. We just have to make choices of what we will continue to carry and what we will let go. We need to learn that our feelings, which we cannot control, do not need to always dictate our actions and reactions, which we can control. And so if we are learning to love, as God calls us to do, then one of the casualties of that process will be our selfish anger. You see, we can't hold a grudge and be healthy. And we can't be healthy and hang on to anger. And we can't hang on to anger and be wise. Think of all of those times that you've been awake at 3 o'clock in the morning thinking up the perfect response to what somebody said to you the previous day. Oh, I guess I'm the only one who does that. (laughs) Meanwhile, what's the other person doing? (laughs) You're doing their work for them. Quite apart from any notion of love, that's just plain dumb. We need to learn that we can control our reactions. 
And if we're still worked up about something that happened years ago, and we take it out and rehearse it, we need to know that it's our heart and our blood pressure and our relationships that are suffering. And that's a question of choice. Anger, grudges, desire for revenge, hurt feelings, they're like a cage. They hold in our minds and our spirits. When, when they want to soar, it's like those things hold us down in the mud. And we are in a cage that only one person can open, and that's you. Now let me be really clear, we're not saying that what was wrong is somehow right. What we're saying is that we can take control of our lives. I am responsible for my actions. Someone else's words may draw deep anger out of me. It may create great rage in me, but I get to choose how I channel or express that anger. That's why it's so important to remember that love, as we have been talking about it, love is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's a commitment. It's a commitment to action. It's not about becoming unemotional or unfeeling like some sort of robot made in the workshop of wonders last week. It's about choosing that my emotions will lead me further in my discipleship following Jesus Christ. Now when we talk about anger, there's a part of my life which was many years ago which knows very well what we're talking about. Knows it at a very deep level of living for years at that pitch of anger and despair that was ready to take everything that was said the wrong way and explode at the slightest opportunity. Not a very pretty part of my life story. And so I'm here to tell you that change is possible. Change is never easy. Any habit that we have has a lot of inertia behind it. Ever tried to change a habit? Well, especially a habit which makes us feel so emotionally revved up. It's hard to change. But it can be done. And it can make life better. We can choose to be different than we are. And I want to be very clear, because sometimes when we have this Christian conversation, people get confused, and it's misunderstood. When the Bible and Jesus talk about gentleness and love and respect and so on and forgiveness, they're not saying that we should somehow become emotional doormats for anybody who comes by to rub their boots on. That's not what's being said. And what's not being said is that wrong is somehow right and that abuse is somehow okay. What's being said is that we are taking charge of our response. What was done to you by someone else may very well have been wrong because evil and cruelty Unkindness and injustice are all too common in the human story. When Jesus instructs us to forgive, it means I will get out of that cage. I will no longer let what you did to me control my life. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean that apology is not needed, that recompense may not be owed, that justice is still to be balanced. It means that I choose. I choose how I will respond. Perhaps you know someone who had, a, had an experience years ago. It may have been a long, a long ordeal, or it may have been a, a short, sharp moment, but it's colored their life. It colored the way they respond to certain situations. It may have colored the way they respond to certain people. And it's always there. In a sense, it's a, a form of PTSD. 
we know soldiers returning from war zones who struggle with that. That, that, that moment, that experience, that, that time shapes the way they live with life. And PTSD is a horrible, horrible thing. But there are many who learn to live full and productive lives in the midst of it. In a similar fashion, we can learn how we will live productive lives in the midst of those things that have hurt us. And forgiveness is one step along the way. We often misunderstand Christian forgiveness as being this wonderful, altruistic, marvelous, aren't I a wonderful person sort of thing. Well, you can look at it that way. I, I'm not that nice a person. I look at it this way. If I forgive you, what you did to me no longer controls me. As long as I let what you did control me, you're still winning the situation, and I don't like that. We forgive to set ourselves free. We forgive to let go of the past. What are some of the other practical applications of this love? Well, we talked about, about the need to, to forgive. We could also talk about communication. Because one of the things that often happens when we're angry is communication breaks down. And so I do something to you. And, and I have to tell you that after years of working with people, I'm convinced that most people do not go through life trying to be miserable to other folk. We just do that naturally. It doesn't require any training or any effort on our part. It just happens naturally. But if we don't have any communication, then you don't tell me that I've hurt you. And then I don't know, so I can't make amends. And meanwhile, you're thinking, oh, well, of course he knows exactly what he did, and he's just compounding his failure by refusing to apologize. Communication is a concrete gift of love. We can also show love by creative empathy by thinking into the other's skin, to use the old phrase, walking a mile in their shoes. Creative empathy is an act of concrete love. We can also do something useful by simply taking ourselves less seriously and others more so. I sometimes think that above the mirror each one of us uses every morning, there should be a motto, just passing through. If you can lower the volume on your own view of yourself and raise your view of others, that's a concrete act of love. The New Testament keeps replaying this message over and over and over again for a couple of reasons. Number one, the center of the message is that God is love. God is that concrete, seeking, caring, compassionate commitment that never gives up. Secondly, because God is that way, we too can love. That's a message that we can never hear too often. And we're going to play a short video. It comes out of a specific scene, a, a specific setting. But I want you to take a look at that, and, and I'm not, I don't think you'll have any difficulty extrapolating it to the rest of life. Amen.